Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Gym Right Live podcast. I am your host, Marcus Gersey, and this week we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Mr. Jason Fernandez here with us. Uh, welcome to the show, Jason. Thanks, brother. Super pumped to be here today. Right on, man. Been looking forward to having you on and doing this episode as, um, you know, building a coach's development program and building a great team is such a key part of running a kick-ass gym that, um, you know, you and I have been going back and forth discussing this concept for a while and glad to actually have you on the show yeah. to, to break this thing down for everybody. Cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's uh, an important concept and, you know, I do want to put out there, like, I've by no means perfected it, but I've made a lot of mistakes uh, throughout the years and, uh, you know, having been on seminar staff, I've learned from a lot of people that are way better than me. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about yourself, man. I know you've been with seminar staff with uh, CrossFit HQ for quite some time. You're owner of CrossFit Rife in Virginia beach. Uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, man. Yeah. So, uh, originally born and raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, multi-sport athlete, uh, ended up playing college basketball at the Naval Academy. Um, uh, was commissioned a naval officer 2004, found CrossFit a couple years later when I was kind of doing the, the very uh, similar story that everybody else has, trying to find something new. So found CrossFit in 2008. I was fortunate enough to wander into Pat Sherwood's gym. So I kind of fell under his wing and another guy named Joe Alexander, who were both flow masters. Pat does, obviously, CrossFit media now, uh, but Joe Alexander is still uh, one of the flow masters. Um, and then around 2009, we kind of, Pat left and then we kind of wandered around for a little bit, started the gym in 2009 and then, you know, kind of fumbled around as a business owner for a while. Uh, and then in 2013, went through the intern process with CrossFit, uh, was fortunate enough to get hired, got hired and then have been working seminars, level one, level twos uh, since 2013. And there's, uh, you know, I've had a lot of other stuff going on in the, in that time frame, And I'm excited because this is the first year where I have nothing else in my life besides, uh, you know, CrossFit HQ duties and the gym. So looking forward to it. Right on, man. And, uh, for those of you, uh, in case you don't know, um, Jason also has a YouTube channel called jerk block talk where you do, is it a weekly episode? Um, it kind of comes and goes. I need to, I need to get a little bit for a while, for a long time. I was weekly. We kind of, we had to take a break at the end of the year because we were doing a, a big expansion project at the gym, which I'm kind of bummed because I wish I would have captured some of that information. Mm. There's 110 episodes on there. The, the premise of this show is, is very similar to what we're doing here today, but it's all about, uh, soup to nuts in the affiliate. So everything from, administrative stuff to coaching on the floor. There's just a lot of tactics and things that we've learned over the years that I just thought would be valuable for people to, to see uh, as somebody kind of goes through it. And there's been some, un some unintended kind of cool things for me, which is kind it's kind of a, it's kind of turned into a documentation process. So I look at some of the videos from a year and a half ago and I see the evolution of the gym. Sure. So, um, it's cool, man. It's been fun. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it. So yeah, yeah man. Fun. Yeah. yeah. You, you put out some really solid content on there, man. And every, every episode I've caught, I'm always impressed. Um, you do a great job. It's, and not to mention just well done, well put together and all that. So, um, if you haven't checked it out yet, make sure you check it out. Uh, all right. So, um, today guys, we're going to be digging into the how and why on building a coach's development program for your team at your box. So as we know, um, you know, the coaches are our product as an affiliate owner or as a gym owner, period. Um, and, you know, your coaches are ultimately responsible for whether or not people get results, they have fun, um, they get and actually stay inspired. You know, a lot of people, when they open their doors, they get up and running, the attention shifts to sales and marketing and growth, which are super important. And, you know, embracing the business aspect of running a gym is, is a huge evolution for gym owners too. But then tends to happen like a, you know, a couple years in, they either revisit this and, and refocus back in on the coaching itself or they don't. And that's usually where the product starts to wane and quality goes down. And they wonder why they're not able to continue to grow and, and impress their community because at the end of the day, what happens is that the clients start catching up to coaches. And this is something I've seen happen a lot of times where, 
you know, the coach starts and maybe, you know, they've been training and coaching for, you know, four or five years. But once they've been open three, four or five years, if they've done a decent job, their athletes kind of catch up with them. So if they're not continually growing and progressing as coaches themselves and developing a team that is embracing progress and embracing education, um, it starts to get stagnant and it'll affect the business. So today we're going to really break this thing down. And uh, Jason's going to share with us how um, how he's done that and, and what he's learned and, and give us a system that we can break down to actually apply in our gym right now. So uh, Jason, any other reasons you think a gym owner should care about this? I mean, I personally, so having owned an affiliate since, or run an, owned and or run an affiliate since 2009, uh, probably anybody that's going to watch this live or later on after the fact, the story of people starting a gym, the, um, there's only, there's pretty much only one story. Somebody started the gym and then the members outgrew the gym and decided they could do it better. Mm. And what, what I want people to try to take away from this is if that happens and that is your gym, that's your fault or it's my fault that that happens because I was not staying ahead of the game. I wasn't doing a couple different things. I wasn't developing myself and or the staff. So if this is not on your radar, it should be because if it's not biting you now, it's going to, if you fail to address this, like it's just inevitable. I mean, ask anybody who's been in the, who's been in the CrossFit space. That's the only story. Somebody, somebody outgrew that gym and they're like, I can do it better. And then the same shit happens to that person and they can't figure out why their coaches left or their members left. So it's yep. just, it's just a cyclical story because people are not focusing on this thing and all the other stuff is important. You know, how you do your business, you know, how you run your finances, your operations and all of that stuff. But if your coaches are not the experts or you're not the expert, people are going to leave. Yep. Not maybe not today, but for sure tomorrow. I mean, I've, I've heard that happen probably in the hundreds of times from the clients that we've worked with over the years where they're like, I don't understand what happened. You know, we, everything was going so good. And then next thing you know, one of my coaches or one of my, you know, longstanding members who I would have considered an ambassador of our gym broke off and took a bunch of the member base with them. Well, you know, and they, and it's kind of a woe is me story to me. All I'm hearing is you, you did not continue to build value to those people, whether it was your members or your staff that this is that this is the best place to be and that this is mm -hmm. where you're going to learn this is where you're going to get the best results this is where you're going to have the best career as a coach all of those aspects were clearly not being addressed right and so what happens mm -hmm. is now you've got someone who thinks yeah i can do this better and because again there's a low barrier to entry with this business model it's not hard to get your level 1 apply for affiliation and you know rack up a couple credit cards and open up down the street and now you're up shit creek so this is to hedge against that, let alone just run a great gym, right? So if that's mm -hmm. a concern, like you said, or maybe not even a concern, it should be something to think about because you want to make sure you are providing the best training experience for your clients and also for your, for your staff. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, it, again, it's, I, I, I've heard the old stories. And then when I go to seminars and we teach level ones or level twos, I, I still hear those stories. And to me, it's almost comical that people haven't figured it out yet. It's, mm. it's, and, and I don't, and I, actually, I'm going to retract that statement. I don't think it's that people haven't figured it out yet. I think it's people have massively underestimated how hard it is to do. And when I say how hard it is to do, how to keep yourself in an ongoing learning environment while then keeping your staff in that learning and, per, and development loop as well. Um, it requires a massive, a massive amount of time and emotion and investment that most people, quite frankly, are just not prepared for. Yep. I, I hear the same thing when it comes to business. And I think just people in general going into this business model wildly underestimate what it takes to build a great business, both from the administrative and sales and marketing side, so more the business end, as well as the product end. You can't forget about the product. It's not just write a workout on the board and because I, you know, you didn't get hurt, it's a win. It's, this needs to be something that's constantly evolving, constantly progressing, and your members need to feel that. Um, and, and people don't realize that when you embark on running your own business, that's the challenge to you. 
It's not just to run a great gym or run a great business. It's also to now continue to develop your product. It's ongoing product development. It applies in every business model where you talk, whether you're talking software, you're talking, you know, a service based model. It has to always be progressing or else you will get outpaced. So uh, yeah, and I get to the point now where I get uneasy if we haven't tried to improve or tweak something, you know, every six to 12 months. Mm. Um, and if I don't, it, it inevitably comes back to bite me. And I'm like, we'll, we'll see, you know, full disclosure. If, if, if I go long stints, 12, six to 12 months without revamping something or going through some sort of really hardcore procedural revamp or coach development, like we will inevitably see a, a downtrend. Now it hasn't happened in a long time, but I can go back and I can point to very specific times where we were not pushing the envelope on how we operate and how we grow ourselves. And there's no shock that there is a corresponding downtrend in membership and revenue and all of that other stuff. So they, they go hand in hand. 100%. All right. So let's dig in here. Um, go. I'm going to go ahead and let you take the reins here because I know you've got a whole like personal development system that, that you apply. Um, so Jason, the mic is yours. Go ahead and kind of get into the what and how of, of how to build a coach's development program. Where does it all start? Yeah, so this is uh, and this is kind of funny, but not funny. the in, The initiation of this conversation is probably where I lose nine out of ten people, right? So it's like, hey, I need to develop my staff, and then I'll say, okay, this whole thing starts with you, mm-hmm. because the principle that I, I so I that. so right, yeah. So it's it, it's one of those things where if you and, and whatever, if you guys if you guys don't agree, that's fine. But go look through. Any affiliate group, Facebook, whatever you want, and really, really look at the number of people who are asking about developing coaches and developing themselves, those questions are not being asked. They're just not present in those threads or those feeds. And I think that's the big mistake. Um, so we're going to get into in the next episode, but a little bit here as well, a lot of um, procedures and tactics of ways to do that. But I think the groundwork of what you're doing should be based on principles, right? And I got this from Ray Dalio, who's a, uh, you know, one of the world's greatest hedge fund managers. Um, so he wrote a book called principles. If you guys haven't read it, read it. Mm. Um, but he, he operates his whole life on principles. And if you have these principles, you can make tactics and tricks and all of those things fit into those principles. So the three principles that I kind of guide myself and the staff, when we start to put these things together, the first one is the development starts with you because fundamentally you cannot give others what you do not have. If you are asking your coaching staff to develop themselves and they need to read and they need to take all these courses, you should probably already have done them. You should probably already have read those books. You should be well ahead of them if you intend to mentor them because again, we're going to go back to that same scenario where they're going to outpace you. So you need to have your own personal development process in place. The second one is give more than you get. And I know this is a struggle for a lot of business owners because you get into that mindset where it's tough. You're in that business mindset where the business might be struggling and you're in a tight spot where it's hard to give more than you get. And now give more than you get can be whatever you want it to be. It can be 5149. It can be 7030. But your staff should feel like they're getting the better end of the deal. And quite frankly, they should be getting the better end of the deal from you. Um, so whatever that looks like for you, just establish that. And then third one is find out what your coaching staff wants. A lot of people like to incentivize people with things they don't want. They want more money. They want more whatever. Well, and then I ask the coach or the gym owner, what does that coach want? Does he want more money? Does he need more money? You're incentivizing with something that he doesn't quite frankly give a crap about. So it's not shocking to me that he's not going to put in work. So sit down with them, have that conversation and find out what they want because then they'll run through walls for you because you're actually giving them the thing that they asked you for. That's and right. I think if you're abiding by those three principles, everything else will start to fall in place after that. And then you can take all of your procedures and line them up through that. And we can dive into, into those as much as you want there, Marcus. But those are the principles that I think will lead most people down the right path and get you started. Um, but the first one is important. And a lot of people just don't like to hear that. And, and they don't like to to be told, yeah, you're, you're actually not as good as you think you are. 
And that applies to everybody. That applies to me. That applies to everybody. you. And, and everybody. And, 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 and if it's not coaching on the floor, then figure out what the other aspect of owning a business or running a gym that you're not good at and start developing yourself there because everybody's got holes in their game. So 100%. it starts with you. I like to set goals every year, a personal goal, a professional goal, and a fitness goal. And I just leave it at three. I don't make it complicated. I want to do this, this, and this. And then I line up everything else for the year based on those things. So um, if you're not reading books and if you're not setting goals, um, I've got a couple of things that I've learned over the year that are beneficial for me, but it starts with me because then what I get to do is take all of that information and then just hand it to the staff. I get to make all the mistakes for them. And what you'll find is that you just get, they develop five times faster than you do, which is awesome to see. Mm -hmm. So start developing yourself first, figure out where your holes are, figure out if you need to read finance books, figure out if you need to figure out like what the points of performance for the air squad are, figure out if you need to figure out under and understand marketing. It does. I don't care. Um, find out what it is and go work on that and then just get in the habit of self development. And then what you'll find, it becomes really easy to mentor people because you'll start once you're okay with identifying and having the humility to understand that you're not good at everything, then you can start to help other people, but not until then it's just, it's just not, it's not going to work until you, until you tackle that first. hundred percent. And it's, you know, the most successful people I think we've all probably met, um, have mentors and this is regardless of their success. So the, the people mm -hmm. who I use as my mentors and have as mentors in my life, they have mentors. And these are people who you'd think like, man, this guy has built, you know, seven figure, eight figure businesses, um, you know, or is living the dream and doing whatever they want to do. And you'd think they're, that's it. They've made it. And that's, that's not the case at all. They'll always tell you they have someone that keeps them in check. Someone who is their, their sounding board, someone who's, who is one to, who, who knows how many steps ahead of them um, mm -hmm. and is doing or has accomplished what they want to accomplish. And it's, it's something that I, I think people talk about a lot, but to actually sit down with someone who legitimately knows more than you and be willing to have someone tell you that's a stupid idea or, Hey, you need to check yourself. You're wasting oh, your fucking time yeah. on something yeah. is it's not easy to do, but it's, it's one of the most important practices to adopt not just as a business owner, but I think just as a person in general, you want to be a better husband, dad, um, you know, leader in your local community, you name it, whatever, swim coach, doesn't matter. You, you, you have to be willing to take feedback and embrace it and for the sake of, I want, I just want to do a better job. I want to be better at what I do. So I'm willing to have someone who I respect give me that feedback and it, it, you will see a direct correlation to when you embrace that concept and you start working with, you know, one or a handful of people who start giving you this feedback with your growth trajectory. You will go through the roof. You will, you will break through the plateaus you've been stuck on potentially your whole life. And all of a sudden yep. they become non issues because you are now personally progressing. And in the context of, of becoming a leader as like the head coach in your gym, by you kind of doing the personal work first and kind of doing it the hard way, like you said, you watch them progress five times faster because you are now able to to, to answer the questions and, and anticipate too that the the sticky parts of something. And ah, you know, this is gonna be a little tricky. I I struggled with that too. I totally get it. Rather than just assuming like, what's your problem? You couldn't read and apply that book in, in two weeks when you know, man, that, that chapter was really rough. In, in kind of adapting that to what we're doing or whatever it may be. It just really helps make it easier for you to, to understand and to pass the information along. Um, 100%. Said, I, I did want to dig into number two and three a little bit um, where you said, yep. you know, give more than you get. Uh, can you give us some examples of what you're talking about there? So uh, one of the very tangible things, and, and I want to come back to number one because I have some tangible things there too about like where to start that whole process. But if we're talking about number two, one of the tangible things as far as like giving more than you get is if you don't have a continued education budget within your gym, you need to start building one. And the easiest way is just, you know, take a percentage of gross revenue of your business and then just create a separate bank account, stick that in there every month. Just start with like 1%. If it's like 70 bucks a month, whatever, jam it in there. Um, and then that way you just get in the habit of squirreling away money that has intent, right? And that way I'm just not like on a whim 
oh, I've got 500 bucks. I'm going to send this coach to this course. So now I've got a budget. So we have a budget and it fluctuates depending on what we're doing and where our focus is, but it can fluctuate anywhere between two to 5% of gross revenue every month. So that money can, can stack up pretty fast if you're doing that. And then you can send coaches to the level two. You can have them sit for their level three. They can go to OPEX or they can do whatever. But when you're setting that aside, now you're starting to, you know, get in the habit of making it a priority financially, which then will allow you to execute on it. Sure. Right. Because the, the, the biggest hurdle that I hear all the time is like, well, I can't afford to send my coach to that thing. Like we don't have that money. Well, then my question is, well, are you planning for it? And the answer is inevitably no. And I'm like, well, shit, you have to fix that first. Like right. you can't just, this is not something you do by the seat of your pants. Like if, if it's going to be a priority, it actually needs to be a priority, which means you need to put money aside to do that. And it should be for you as the owner and as the, as the gym owner. And then as, uh, and then for your staff as well. And then that leads into number three, which is just ask them what they want. Sure. Right. So I've built this this thing on the side, I'm, I'm giving them more value in the form of actually subject matter experts mm -hmm. that, are, that is not me, right? So I can send them to somebody else because everybody knows that like I can say knees out, but at some point, like my wife's not li listening to me anymore. But if the other coach says knees out, she's like, oh, I'm going to push my knees out. So sometimes right. you need to have a third party, um, you know, kind of give them that information so it's actually received. So I think it's important to start doing that first and foremost. And then when I say give more than you get, it doesn't always necessarily need to be in the form of money or certifications or courses or whatever. It can just be your time, right? Sitting down once a month, whatever. So we just revamped how I, how I um, do this in our gym. So I have a block of time once a month that we sit, I sit down with the staff and we discuss whatever they want. It could be about the gym. It could not be about the gym. It could be about their marriage, their money, whatever. And nine times out of 10, it is not about the gym because the reality is like, that's not the shit they're worried about. So giving them your time is far more valuable than you could ever imagine. And then you can help guide them through that because if you can help them get into a spot where they're happy and they're healthy and all of those things, guess what? By default, you have a better product on the floor as an employee, but you have to sit down and have those conversations with them and find out what it is that they need from you. And I would tell you, most gym owners have no idea what kind of struggle their employees are having mm. or what they want. Well, and at the end of the day, you know, I think for most of us, the goal is to, to build a staff and a, really build a career for the coaches that we have. We want, you know, I don't want my coach to juggle two to three other part-time jobs because I can only, you know, give them a few classes here and there. I want to bring people in and make them full-time coaches. This is all they mm -hmm. sleep and breathe so that we can create a better product so that they can be bought into, you know, showing up a little early for class and staying a little later. And it's not just, Hey, I'm, I'm in and out on the hour. And, and really that's, that's what creates a lot of those little magical moments for your members is, is someone just being there and giving a shit. And for us, you know, you, you have to, as the owner and as, as the tribe leader to them, you have to understand that this is, if they can do that, that's going to make that, that completely changes everything for them. So sitting down with them yeah. on a regular basis and saying, look, what I really want to know what you want so I can actually help you get there. Because mm -hmm. I, I know that this isn't a one size fits all kind of deal and that every one of you on our team has different needs and different wants and different goals. And I want to make sure that I can, I can accommodate that and create a path to get you to where you want to be. Even if that means your goal is to open your own gym someday. Great. I'm going to groom yeah. you to be the best damn coach, <laughs> you know, gym manager, whatever path we're going to take here. I'm going to make you the best. And then that way, now you have an ally rather than someone kind of trying to scrounge the info and, and jetting out the back door. You want to work with them and help them create that, which is actually going to create much more buy-in to you. And who knows what that leads to down the road. But uh, I, yeah, I agree with you a hundred percent. And that's the scenario. Uh, like I have a coach who wants to do that and I'm okay with that. And I, as, as a person and as a professional, I, I'm, when this is all said and done, I'm going to be disappointed if I don't have a coach that leaves my facility 
and opens their own gym. Right. Like I'm going you know, you to be disappointed. I'm going to be disappointed. Uh, I'll be, I'll, I'll consider that a failure. But far too many people uh, are offended by that thought. Sure. Where I'm just like, okay, well, cool. Like, let, let's start mapping that out. What does that look like? It only benefits you as the gym owner. A lot of people see it as a loss. So they're losing a coach. And I'm like, well, if you're helping this person get what they want. So Johnny comes in. He's like, hey, I, I really would like to open a gym someday. And I'm like, okay, great. What, what does your timeline look like? When would you like to do that? Simply by asking that question, I can now plan my future as well as his. Right. Because if, I, if he's like, hey, it's 24 months, we start to map that out. And I'm like, I don't think 24 months is doable. 36 is probably a little bit more realistic. Now, we're going to map out these things. All right. We're going to map out your finances. We're going to map out what you need to do as far as like your SOPs and all that stuff. I'll give you all of the tools that we already use here. Use them. I don't care. And then what you can ask for them from them in return is now what I need you to do is help me train your replacement. Mm -hmm. So I'm, we're not going to have a void. There's going to be no loss in service. You'll have people that are going to miss the coaches, but what you don't want is this huge gap where I have my top coach who left and now there's this massive drop off in service provided. If in fact, it's not going to be me that has to go back in there and coach all of those classes. Right. Um, so then you both win, right? So now I'm grooming the next person with the help of this person who I'm going to help go start their own gym. Right. On. And then it's a win win. Right. So, and I think far too many people see that, that scenario as a negative when it's actually a positive. Yep. Because then it opens up other doors. It opens up other doors, meaning if if somebody like if somebody's going to come to me and ask me to mentor them in coaching, when I start to mentor this person or teach them how to coach, I'm very quickly going to, whether I tell them or not, understand what I'm good and bad at or what I do and don't know. And it's no different from a business standpoint. You will get better at running your gym and your business by helping somebody else to do that. You will just inevitably seek out information. So again, it, it's a it's a really big win, particularly if you do it on your own terms. Yep, no doubt. Well, Ryan, well let's uh, let's dig into um, into kind of the format because I know you've got a whole a whole system uh, in place for like creating a, a coach's development program. Because this is all I think mm -hmm. kind of prefacing the whole the, the whole rest of the conversation here. Um, and, and I and I know that you. When you teach this, you, you told me this before. You said, you know, this, this system is assuming that you are already continuously working on developing yourself as a coach, business person, individual. Yeah. So basically everything we just talked about, guys, is, uh, this is kind of the minimum requirement. This is the buy-in to building a coach's development program. Because if you're not actively doing what we're already talking about, um, then you'd be putting the cart before the horse. What do you want to add to that? So, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually, this will bounce back to like making sure that that first principle is actionable. Um, so here's how you're going to know if you're ready to start building your kind of coaches development or, or mentoring program, whatever you want to call it. Um, a, do you have a mentor? Mm -hmm. If you don't, you're not ready to start the process. You need to get one first. And, and you should have one. I have multiple mentors. I'm kind of like a mentor whore. Like I just love <laughs> to have people give me information. I, I do. I like, I, I just love information. Um, so if you are not actively having periodic conversations like once a month or something like that with a gym owner who you consider to be successful, do that tomorrow. Call somebody. I need to schedule a phone call with you or a face or a Skype or whatever. Make that happen. It's on your calendar. It never gets interrupted. It's a priority. And then the same thing from a coaching standpoint. Um, if you want to be a really good coach, it is beyond me. How many people say they want to get on? We'll just use seminar staff because that's, that's my life. Say they want to get on seminar staff and then never seek out the help of somebody who's on seminar staff. Right. Until, like, I have a guy coming to my gym from, I think he's coming from D.C. next week. He's like, hey, I'm going to come by and I'm just going to sit in the corner of your gym on Thursday. And I'm like, great. Tell me what you want to know. I'm happy to help you. Far too few people are doing that. It, it, I, and I don't understand why. Like, I just don't get it. And, and then and then we see people come through the internship or they go through the level two and their mind is blown because they find out that they have holes in their game. And it's not that you're a bad person. 
just like everybody, like you just don't know what you don't know. So go find out what you don't know and then address those things immediately. So get a mentor. If you don't have somebody that you kind of report to, like on a very periodic basis as a coach and as a business or gym owner, you need to have that. Once you have those, then I would tell you you're ready to start this next process. Got it. All right, cool. So what's the, what's the first step? Cool. So the, uh, the two big things that is, is frequency of these sit downs. And I think you need to schedule these out. So like I was mentioning before, um, I have two different things that I sit down with my coaching staff about on a monthly basis. And this will kind of ebb and flow based on the experience of your staff. So it will ramp up for a while and then it might come back down because everybody's where you need them. And then you'll figure out they need to come back up and we're kind of back on the upswing right now. So schedule it. It needs to be scheduled on your calendar where they sit down with you and you sit down and have a conversation with them, block out an hour. I rarely have one of these conversations that doesn't last an hour. Right. And this is where you start asking them what they want. What are their pain points? Um, what do they think they're bad at? What are the things they want to achieve? Go over things like their perfect day. Um, what are their annual goals? Look at that stuff, ask them, and you should have a notebook for each coach, right? That you have it. It's cataloged of everything that you have to have. So if you have seven coaches, you have seven notebooks, John, Sally, Susan, Bob. And when they sit down, you're there taking notes, writing that shit down. Yep. And then that will help you guide all of the conversations afterwards and you'll have check-ins. Hey, I know last time we talked about you wanted to do, or you wanted to take the CSCS. Have you started studying? Did you register for the test? What's the date? Give me a timeline so that I can hold you accountable. Start doing those things. The second one is that I try to do once a month, I try to do a class evaluation on one of my coaching staff. And I know you had a previous show uh, that has a really awesome template for how to evaluate coaches. That needs to happen, in my opinion, in most gyms, at least every 30 days. Yep. If not, if not more frequently. And depending on their coach and their experience, it should happen more frequently than that. The important thing about that is whether you do it in a very systematic format or you kind of free flow you just kind of sit over in the corner and you just take notes um it needs to be tangible so that you can give it to give that to them and in my experience it is best that the feedback is immediate yep. right if i evaluate a class today and i don't give them the feedback until next friday that opportunity is lost they don't actually remember what the hell happened yep. so all of my feedback doesn't matter anymore um and sometimes and sometimes i'll do that impromptu like it wasn't planned i'll be taking a class with that coach as soon as they're done i'll pull them to the side and i'll say hey look i just want to show you i want to bring something to your attention as far as your logistical layout of what you are doing here's where i think you could have cleaned that up uh and it would have saved you six minutes in your lesson plan in my opinion and those are the things that you need to be actively doing all the time uh, so mm -hmm. if you have seven coaches on your coaching staff, just doing those two things, that's 14 hours a month. And going back to what I said earlier, like this is a major time commitment on your part. Like it needs to be on your calendar yeah. and you can do the, the coach evaluations one of two ways. And I would suggest you do it both. Mm -hmm. Tell them you're going to do an evaluation and then sometimes impromptu, just have a seat in the corner and watch them coach. Um, but at the end you need to give them the evaluation so that they can have it and they can review it because this is how I evaluate my coach on their ability to implement feedback. If I have to give them the same advice six times, we need to have a different conversation. Well, and you, you set the expectation, you know, and, and we'll, I know we'll get into this a little bit, I think more so in the next episode, but you know, it's, it's also in how you're, how you're onboarding someone, you're setting expectations like, Hey, we're going to be regularly shadowing classes. I'm going to be giving you direct feedback. I expect the same thing. If you take my class and you've got good feedback, don't not tell me, tell me right afterwards while it's fresh, give me the feedback because at the end of the day, we're here to deliver the best damn class experience and training experience for our members that we can possibly do. So no holds barred. We're all here to help each other get better. If you know, I would look at it as a negative if you didn't tell me. Don't think just because I'm your boss that this is going to be, you know, I'm going to be pissed about it or something like that. And when we... And, 
Go ahead. Uh, when we implemented right. even just the like the scorecard that I shared on the, the, the previous episode where we basically, here's how to create a, a five-star class experience, that was based off of just doing the loose notes over and over and over and basically realizing like, hey, here are the things that I keep wanting to measure and creating a system so that I can basically fill this out and say, here here's my checklist of the things that I, I at least want to see, let alone the whole backside of the page of all the rest of the notes I would fill in. Right. So don't just follow that scorecard, guys, and think that that's the end all be all. That was just the kind of minimum requirement for running a decent yeah. class. The back of that paper was filled with all the details of the other observations that I would take along the way because I would then sit down immediately after class. We would actually schedule a class shadow session and immediately afterwards, it would have to be that another coach would take over and that that coach was able to sit with me. So it was either at a time of day where there was a break immediately after, or we would adjust the schedule so that the coach was available. So that class is over. Hey, everybody, good job today. We'll see you tomorrow. Come on over. And we're immediately sitting down while it's fresh. Because what I noticed was that when we would do it immediately, they would come out of the class going, ah, I know I, I missed this person and that person. It's fresh. It just happened. And we're actually able to make way more progress. And just by doing that and implementing a regular routine once a month, I think is, is a great place to, to get to once you're kind of more in a routine. But for most people, when they first start implementing this, I say, if you can, if you have the capacity and you're trying to go from no structure to some structure, do it once a week. We would do it once a week for a few, yeah. we did it for a few months mm -hmm. that way. People were blown away. The, the feedback from members was just, holy smokes, you guys are, this has gotten, I mean, I loved this place before, but I am just, you guys are crushing it. These classes are getting so yeah. good because they saw the coaches like actively applying something, applying, and it wasn't just one coach that was getting a lot better because one was trying and mm -hmm. the rest weren't. We collectively as a group were progressing along the same standards and improving on the same key points over and over and over again. In a matter of just a short few months, you can take what felt like a very loose structure or, or structureless uh, class environment to something that has a lot of structure. Coaches are paying attention to details from time management to your whiteboard presentation to how you're queuing, how you're you know using everyone's name in each class, closure to each class, those little things that's just a framework to start. And then once you have that basic framework and start and your coaches are used to getting feedback and giving feedback as well, now you can really start to build on the long game because the, 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 the expectation and communication is open. It's there. They're expecting you to come in and give them feedback so that you can get better. And I think what you hit on there at the end there was, uh, and, and this will probably not go well at first. So just, I'm forewarning everybody when you start giving feedback. And I think that's why it's important that, uh, the frequency when you start, this should be a little bit higher and then you can dial it back. People are going to give you pushback on getting feedback. Sure. They just don't, nobody likes it at first until they understand that you are not attacking them personally, that you are there to try to make them better. It's, you're going to have some very awkward, uneasy conversations where it's like, how did it go? And they're like, I think it went well. And you're like, it was not good. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was devastating, you know? Yeah. So you're going to have to have those conversations and it's going to take some time for people to be able to internalize that and then be able to take action on it without being butthurt about it. So the frequency should be a little bit higher. And then you as the, as the, head honcho need to give them time to acclimate to that. Like you need to have a realistic expectation about what this is going to look like as far as turnaround time for them to start to be able to just come ask you for feedback. Be like, Hey, did you see that class? What do you think? And that will eventually start to happen, but it's going, it's going to take time. It's going to take months as a matter of fact, before they are, before they really buy into, I want feedback. Um, and then you'll know, I think one of the big things, so I learned this from James Hobart, who obviously is a games athlete, works on seminar staff, and he kind of impressed this upon me. Um, he's, uh, he, James, and by the way, James is a guy who's a phenomenal athlete, but he's a better coach, frighteningly enough. His thing is like, so we get evaluated when we do seminars and stuff like that, and so let's say a coach goes over time on a lecture or a breakout or something like that. He's not so 
upset if you go over time where he's upset as if you don't know why. Like if you're like, Oh, I just don't know. I don't know what happened. Like that's when he gets upset. So when you are evaluating your coaches, eventually you want to get them to the point where you're like, Hey, the timeline got a little off. And you're like, I know I blew it in the general warm up. I should have cut out three or four of those line drills. And I knew when I was, and I knew when I was behind and you're like, okay, cool. We don't need to discuss it. You're good. Um, mm -hmm. so in that, in that process is going to take time and going back to you developing yourself when you're writing feedback and you can chime in on this, Marcus, um, I think if you're not capable of watching a 60 minute class and writing shit, three pages of notes, mm -hmm. you need to have somebody come in and evaluate your class because you're, you're, you're missing some things that could be improved and you're going to have to seek that out from somebody else. Like you should be able to just sit there with a pen and paper and write for 60 minutes on what that coach is doing. And I see a lot of people give feed feedback and they're like, it was pretty good. And I'm like, what were you watching the same thing I was watching? Like, that was not good. We can right. fix it though. Um, so I think that's how you can kind of gauge your own ability to give feedback is like how much feedback do you actually have to give when you sit down and watch a class? Yep. It's, it, it's a reflection of what, what your capacity is as a coach and what you're able to even see. Right. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, and by the way, real quick, um, if, I'm going to pause you for one quick second, Jason. Uh, yeah, if ahead. you're watching this and you've got questions, um, be sure to put them in now. So if you're watching this live, excuse me, put them in now and start adding them in. I already see probably, you know, four or five questions have already been put into the queue here. We'll get to them, uh, towards the end of the show. And, um, so just go ahead and add them in because I am willing to bet we're going to get quite a few here. And if you're watching yeah, this, please ask questions, guys. Please ask questions because I love nothing more than to answer these types of questions. Like, please put them in there. Whatever your scenario is, put it in the questions. Awesome. Yeah. And if we're, and if you're watching this after the fact, so after it's, uh, been aired, um, same thing applies. Put your questions in because we'll, uh, Jason and I just tag us in the comment and, uh, we'll be happy to address it. Um, Jason, I know is uh, super active in here. He's given a ton of great feedback, um, in, uh, uh countless threads in the network. And, um, I'm sure we'll be happy to address that. So, um, all right, cool. So we've got the, the planning, right? So we've got technical evaluation. We've got the one-on-one -on -one sit down with your team member. Um, what's next? Um, from there, then you want to go implementation. So this is where you just follow up. So you have to put the stuff in place and then it, again, going back to put it on the calendar, um, you need to execute on it. So it needs to be, and I suggest this, you need to put it at least for the individuals, what I recommend is putting it in a position that's convenient for the staff member. Mm -hmm. um, that way, it, it should be somewhat inconvenient for you, and that's okay for the time being. Make sure it's a, it convenient for them because then they'll be bought in. It shouldn't be like when they have to be home to walk the dog or, or go pick up their kids, stuff like that. Um, but then what you want to do is get this on the calendar. It's recurring, preferably. That, that, that way you get into like, this is my normal on Tuesday at 3 PM. I sit down with Cassidy or whoever, and that is blocked out. We mm -hmm. both know it's there and it's important. Yep. And then from there, um, you know, you should follow up with them occasionally, um, outside of that too. So like you should be following up just kind of like in passing occasionally be like, Hey, uh, I saw this, just remind me, I've got some things for you that I want to talk about when we sit down on Thursday. Um, and then from there, a couple of things you want to do um, is considerations for your new coaches if you're giving these feedback. So we'll just use the six criteria for that we have in the CrossFit Level 1 and the Level 2 manual. So there's teaching, seeing, and correcting, presence and attitude, group management, um, and, and demonstration. And in those primarily what I would recommend for new coaches is the seeing and correcting is just going to take time. Like they're not going to get better at that in a week. They need to see thousands of reps. So for the most part, I'm not going to say give them a pass, but don't beat them up too much on like, Oh, you didn't correct, you know, Bob's third pull in the snatch. And of course they didn't, they didn't see it. So don't beat them up on that where they can have immediate improvements is, uh, is group management. So a lot of our newer coaches, one of the things that we focus on pretty heavy on the front end is their ability to manage a timeline, yep. right? Their ability to lay out a logistical 
uh, a logistical plan within the class, where they put the equipment, what direction the athletes are facing, being concise with their instruction. Um, that will make them effective tomorrow. Right. Uh, and just learning how that works and learning to execute a timeline. Uh, the other stuff will come with time. But if you're a great coach that can see and correct and is really on the ball, but you are a disaster logistically, um, that's a bad experience. I don't, I don't care how proficient you are at breaking down the snatch. If everybody's facing a different direction, there's fucking barbells everywhere, and it's just disorganized, like that's a shitty class. Yeah. So those two things that you can help them frame up first are the group management and presence and attitude. And that will, what that will do is that will lend itself to allowing them to focus purely on the seeing and correcting portion of that. Because if they have their plan laid out and then they're prepared, they've prepped, they've practiced, they've done a dry run, they've gone through that. Now they get to just focus on what their job is, which is to improve movement because they've done all the, all the legwork on the front end. So when you're new coaches, that is where I would prioritize my feedback. Don't get into the nuances of the push jerk and all of that stuff. Hey, focus two things. Here's the two things I want you to focus on. When you do your line drills, here's what I, here's what I recommend that you're doing. When you lay out the classroom, I want you to consider these three things. Um, and then that will help them not get crushed by the members, quite frankly, because chances are your new, your, your newer coaches are not as adept at that skill as your, as your more experienced coaches and the members are going to notice. So if you want there to be as little deviation as from member experience as possible, they need to be logistically sound. Uh, otherwise, everybody's going to notice because it's just going to be a goat rope. Yep. Um, so those are the two things I would tell you is on your on your newer staff, a presence and attitude and group management are my two primary focus points. And I don't really get into the other stuff until we've mastered those. It's a really good point, man, because it's um, when we at Active we did it, we did it exactly that way because those were the things that if you know if you it doesn't matter how good you are, like you said, at correcting the snatch. If the classes are running late and it's just a shit show in regards to how the class is organized and people are, are all over the place, it creates unnecessary friction for the members and for you as a coach that you can't even concentrate because you're just on catch up and on cleanup throughout the entire class because you're behind or, Hey, we, I know we started late and now I'm rushing through the actual coaching part. So just getting them to be able to, to stay on time, to, to get through everything in an organized fashion, consider the layout of the class, make sure everything's organized and then be connect with everyone on a personal level. Hey, Susie, great to see you using people's names, having a good attitude, man, it goes such a long way. Cause now there's space. Now there's actually the room in the, in the, in the class itself for that coach to focus in on cueing, mm -hmm. correct, you know, seeing, cueing, correcting and all that. And yeah. can now actually focus on the craft where I, I think that's and, a really, really good point. Um, and it's just, it's re it's realistic on your part. If, if the expectation sure. is that they should come in and, and be able to just eyeball all of the movement and see and correct, you know, really, really quickly. Uh, for me, that just demonstrates that you do not understand the process and how this works. Like that's just an unrealistic expectation to lay on your coaching staff. Um, and therefore you will get a lot of pushback, which would be justified in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, there, they, you shouldn't expect them to know all of those things. That doesn't mean that you're bringing the standard down. Like the standard is the standard. So we're going to push you towards that, but I'm not going to browbeat a new guy or a new girl because she missed hip opening on the push jerk. And she's, you know, a couple weeks into the intern process. Like that, right. that is unrealistic and, and not what I should be focusing on anyway. We'll get there. And the members don't know anyway, right? They do not know if they're doing that or not. So that's, those are things that you can kind of let slide by and you can kind of clean those things up afterwards without making the coach look like a shithead. Totally. Right on. Okay. Well, we've got some good questions rolling in. Uh, anything else you want to add, uh, before we get into the Q and a portion? No, I think, um, the big things are just figure out what your principles are. You know, if, you know, if you want to steal mine, steal them, I don't care. Um, but figure out what your principles are and those will help you guide everything else after that. And because those decisions you make on how you build your structure and how you develop your program, um, they should fall back into those principles. And I think it's really hard to go wrong when you build it upon that because there's no right or wrong way to do this stuff. 
the only thing that, that makes it right or wrong is, is its effectiveness. You can go to a hundred different gyms that are doing this effectively and they're probably all doing it a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would argue the principles are probably very similar. So, sure. So we've got a good framework. So we've got the three principles of, you know, development starts with you. Um, you know, so focus on yourself first, then give more than you get and then figure out what they actually want, what's important to them. Um, and then we get into uh, basically planning it out, the, the two functions, technical evaluation, the one-on-one sit down, implementing the plan, you know, setting the time aside for it, making it a priority, following up with the staff, um, and then let you had the considerations for the new team. Um, yeah. it, let's, let's get into some questions. I've been seeing some good ones okay. rolling in here. So, um, okay. I'll start up here. So we've got one from, uh, John David, uh, it says, um, what happens if Johnny's intent is to find the first 25 members of his new gym from your current membership base? So this is back to where we were talking about kind of developing someone to open their own gym. So if a staff member says, Hey, my goal is to open my own gym, you know, how, how would you address that question? Um, well, so this is a little bit of an introspective deal where somebody, people may not like my answer, which is if you are doing number one on the principles and you're developing yourself, nobody's leaving. Right. So, um, they're going to leave if he's better than you. Right. So it's not a competition, but at the same point, like I'm trying to outpace the staff because my goal is to give back. Right. So if you're doing that, I don't think you should worry about it. Um, I think you'll, that, that, that scenario will iron itself out. But the bottom line is if people leave your gym to go follow another coach, like that's your fault. Totally. Like you, you should, if you're doing all the right things, if you're investing in the people, um, this is a non-issue. Yep. And maybe they do leave because they have some sort of affinity towards that coach. Then here's what I would argue. You should let them leave because what's in, what should be important to you is what's best and in the best interest of the, of the consumer. And if they just love Sally, they should go train at Sally's gym. Right. 100%. That's it. You want people who are at your gym for, for you and your culture and what you bring. And if, you know, they've built a great relationship with that coach, um, and they want to follow them, that's one thing. Um, you know, and w- when I, when I read the question, you know, if Johnny's intent is to find the first 25 members at your gym, I think that's, again, that's a relationship challenge between you and yeah. Johnny and you not having built enough value in your relationship and trust that where they're going to be able to say like, Hey, well, how do I get my members? And like, that's something you should be able to speak openly with Johnny about in, in yeah. helping them get up and running. Right. I think those, I think those are things that will come to light if you're doing your one-on-one sit downs. I mean, every, anybody who's on this thread knows like gyms are like a high school. Like you probably know all the stuff that's going on in your gym. If that, if that comes to light that there's potential poaching, whatever you want to call it mm-hmm. for new members, that's a conversation you need to have with Johnny and just say, Hey Johnny, um, I know you want to start your own gym and here's the truth. You don't need my members, man. I'm going to tell you how to get your own members. Right. Like if they follow you organically, then, then that's fine. I'll have no beef with that, but you know, and you just have to draw the line in the sand, but if your intent is to just take people, we have a problem and you'll go away. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. Next question from Sam Lowe. Uh, question is, uh, if working with a 100% part-time staff, does that change the, what do you need question? No, I, I actually, I, I would argue it's, uh, it might be more important, mm-hmm. uh, because I have a lot of part-time staff and those, and that's why I was going go back to what I said earlier. A lot of the things you're going to discuss with them will probably be non gym related. Mm-hmm. So these are the questions that are people that are part that, so we'll just go down the scenario where I have a part-time staff member who wants to be full-time and they have a job. So now with that person, I can start developing the plan to systematically leave that job and then get into the gym. And what we've done is together, we've created a framework for what that timeline looks like, what it is that they need financially. Mm-hmm. And that way we can start to build that plan around it and we can start talking about, okay, well, if we're going to do that, then you need to start building up, you know, if you need a full-time, you know, a full-time salary to replace 
your income, maybe the gym doesn't make that kind of revenue, then maybe we need to look at starting to build your personal training book exactly. or maybe having uh, a couple things with like, oh, you love to run? Let's start running endurance classes that you will take a percentage of that revenue. So um, I think it's more important there because the part-timers are the ones that are most likely to leave. Right. Not the full-timers that you're paying a salary, like they're good. So the part-timers, it's more important to find out what their pain points are to see if you can resolve them and find out, do, do they want to be part-time forever? If they do, that's fine. But now I can start crafting my plan around, okay, well, you know, you know, Sue doesn't want to be a gym manager. So I'm not going to talk to Sue about that. I'm just going to get Sue into a point where she's happy with this book of clients for personal training and coaching 20 classes a week because, or a month because everybody just loves Sue. Yep. Um, so no, it doesn't change it at all. It, it, it arguably might be more important for your part-timers. 100%. We, uh, for me, I always looked at the part-timers, um, exactly as I need to figure out why they're doing this. Why are they willing to give up their, you know, two nights or three nights a week or their Saturday mornings to come in here and just coach a couple classes? It's clearly not for the money oftentimes. And no. to get to the root of why they do this, is so important because now you're able to see, well, what, you know, what path or what do I want to offer them? Because they, gym owners will often think that they just want more hours. That's not necessarily true. They want no, to, it's usually not true. Nobody they, wants to work more. Right. It's, that's usually actually not what it is. It's not that everyone's trying to become a full-time person at your gym. It's oftentimes in this, in this business and people who are, who are part-time coaches for them, it's way more intrinsic about, you know, hey, this is my opportunity to give back or, hey, I want to be able to teach my kids or have, you know, who knows? I want to become a better presenter and speaker and feel more comfortable. And who knows what the thing is, but you don't know. And you can't now help further that if you're if you don't know what it is. And in my experience, these these part timers are actually huge assets for your full time staff, because these are oftentimes also the people that will come in if you you know, if someone has to, you know, if you lose a, a staff member who was a, you know, had a larger part of your schedule or is out sick or wants to take a vacation, these part timers play a key role. And what you don't want to have is a, is a huge difference in quality and buy into your culture between your full timers and that part timer. Cause then you'll have, Hey, all your classes are awesome, but I never come on Wednesday nights cause I hate coach Steve because he's clearly just phoning it in. He doesn't give a shit. He doesn't do all the same things that you do when you run your class because Clearly, they're not bought in because you're not making yeah. this something that they can sink their teeth into on, you know, for them personally. And and I think I think this goes back to the give more than you get. I think uh, not enough people are OK with, you know, CrossFit gyms are not unique, meaning it's a business just like everything else. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a lot of head coaches, gym owners, whatever, who, again, get maybe offended if there's a coach who comes in who wants to use this opportunity as a, uh, as a leap path to go else. Mm -hmm. and they'll, and they'll turn that person away or they'll, or they'll squash that idea. Right. Well, I think you should do the opposite. They're like, Hey, I really want to get into, you know, so I, we run an intern process with, um, uh, with old dominion university where we have a lot of those athletes that are going through, um, those programs and they come and intern with us. And these are, these are coaches that a lot of them don't want to coach CrossFit. They want to get into traditional strength and conditioning. And I'm like, that's cool. Guess what? All the principles are the same. Like you still need to see in correct movement. I don't care if you don't want to, if you don't want to coach CrossFit, you're still, you know, a likable person who has good skill sets that I value. I'll bring you in. I'll coach you. It's only going to help me to help develop you and develop my skills. And then we'll get you where you want to go because now what you're developing is a center for excellence where people come to you beating your door down because you're the guy that gets people where they want to go. So in doing that, what you're actually end up doing is filtering for the best potential. Yep. Right. If you're helping people go where they want to get your, all you're going to do is attract high achievers, which is huge. Best place to be. Best place to be. Awesome. Uh, next question here from Louis or Louis Sika. Um, 
what are some good non-CrossFit continuing education courses you recommend or which CrossFit continue ed courses would you recommend to improve the coach that can be applied for general public? Cool. So I, I actually love this question and some people disagree with it. I think this largely depends on what you want to do. Hmm. So for instance, um, there's a lot of them out there and I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer of you should probably pursue most of them. So CS, CS, Exos, OPEX, CrossFit, one, two, three, four, start pursuing all of those things. The certificates that you get behind your name are largely not important. What it tells me is that somebody who start trying to achieve these things has a hunger for growth, right? And that's the important piece. Now, depending on what you're going to, so like I've taken the CSCS, largely I think it's worthless from the, from the standpoint of, uh, like it, does it actually prepare somebody to coach? But if I'm trying to get into high school strength and conditioning, guess what? You should go take the CSCS because that's cost of entry in that world. So again, it depends on what you want to do and what your goal is. Start knocking, you know, start uh, checking off the boxes of the things that line up with your goal. So as a mentor, if you're lining up your coaches, hey, well, I want to get into, you know, coaching volleyball athletes or whatever, and you're sitting down with your staff and that's what they tell you. I'm like, cool, then we need to get into uh, CSCS. Like, if you don't have a degree, we need to start pushing you towards that. And if you can't get one, then you need to get the, uh, what's the one below? CPT, I think, where you need to go get that. Because again, to some extent, the market is going to determine cost of entry depending on where you want to go. Like if you want to be known as the head honcho CrossFit gym in town, like you should get a level three and start pursuing the level four. Um, if you don't care about that stuff, do level one and then pursue your other stuff, get into Exos or whatever those things are. So I, I don't think there's a wrong answer. I think it's, are you doing it or are you not doing it? And I think a lot of people want this, course or this whatever to be the answer and that's just never the case it's it's not like there's not one thing that's going to put you over the top it's this massive accumulation of information over the course of time days months years decades that will eventually establish you as an expert yeah and if i can add a little bit to that you know um from the different courses that are out there i mean you listed off i mean pretty much all the top courses the only one i would add to that um are the on it certifications on it has put oh, okay. together some seriously kick ass programs uh, from their foundations course to their durability course. Uh, if you have not checked them out before, uh, they are far more than just a really cool looking brand with, you know, supplements and all that, which is kind of how they got started. But they're, uh, you know, John Wolf over there uh, directs uh, the, the whole fitness program and it is stellar. Everyone who I know who's a, who's a good coach who's gone through those programs was thoroughly impressed um, with the information and just the quality of the programs. Um, I think they're doing, they've, they've got them all over the place now, or they're, excuse me, they're, they're hosting them all the time. So uh, check them out too. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think the important thing there is, is again, like I, I'm not a big fan of anybody that hangs their hat on credentials. I think you should, you know, if you want to be recognized as a professional, you should pursue most of them so that at the bare minimum, you can just speak to them. But again, figure out what it is that you want to do. Like I know on it, a lot of the stuff that on it does, I forgot to mention that one. So I'm glad you brought that up, Marcus, but a lot of the stuff that on it does lends itself very well to personal training. Big time. Um, as does, as does OPEX, you know, CSCS is, you know, we'll let, I don't think it lends itself well to anything, but again, that's cost of entry. So that will get you in the door at least, or a, a allow you to have a conversation with a high school or a JUCO school or a D3 school, you know, and then if you're going to get into CrossFit and you want to pursue that, you know, like you need to go take the level two and, and those courses are only getting harder. You know, we just launched the, the new level two, which is a test. So okay. now there's a test. Yeah, there's a test at all four levels. You're gonna you're gonna test at the level one. You're gonna test at the level two, and then the level three is just the test. And then the level four, um, don't hold me to this, but I think that's supposed to be accredited and online this year. Where like you're gonna walk in and there, that's a test. Like that is a practical test. So, mm. you know, I think you should pursue all of those. And worst case scenario, you find out something about yourself, which is not actually worst case scenario. So, right, just emotionally. Um, all yeah. right. 
Next question here. Uh, another question from uh, Lewis. Uh, question is, how would you develop coaches that have as much experience training clients as you might have? So I think this kind of goes back to what we were saying uh, before. Uh, then you need to work on yourself. If you plan on developing uh, a coaching staff, or if you're the one responsible for it, then you need to work on yourself first. If you're not the one personally who's responsible for it, you need to have whoever is developing your coaches be constantly developing and progressing to yeah. stay ahead. Well, I also think that there's uh, there's more than one layer to this. So it's not so maybe they do know more about you than the snatch, right? So I have a I have a guy in my gym, Phil Sabatini. He's a finished second, third at the AO this year. Um, former national champion is a 94 kilo weightlifter. Um, he has set, we have 70 weightlifters in house. Guess what? Phil knows more about weightlifting than I do and probably will ever know. That doesn't mean that I can't help Phil develop in other areas. So they might be a technical expert at their thing, but your job is to figure out where their other holes are. Like maybe, maybe they want to build. Uh, a different skill set. Maybe they don't know how to market themselves. Maybe they know nothing about business. Maybe their personal life is a disaster. I don't, I don't know. Like there's a lot of different places that you could go with that. Um, and all I would tell you is simply ask them. I, I think this is a very powerful question and you just say, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What do you need? Yeah. Right on. And they'll tell you. All right. Next question from Emily Cabral. Hey, Emily. Um, what do you consider full-time versus part-time? Uh, well, full-time would be somebody who like, that's all they do. Like they, they literally just coach and they, they earn a living wage coaching. Um, part-time is usually somebody who has another job. Um, now there's a couple of versions of part-time probably where like you might have a younger coach who lives at home with their parents and doesn't need to earn a living wage and they work 30 hours to 40 hours a month for you. Um, but full time would be somebody who like, they are a professional coach. Like yeah. that is their job. When somebody asks them what they do for a living, they're like, I coach CrossFit. Right. Yeah. And if, if Emily, you're asking from like an hour standpoint, the way, the way that we looked at it at active was basically anything. If you were over 15 hours a week, we considered you, and this was your primary. That's kind of like the sweet spot. Some people will say 20 hours, um, but you know, if, if someone's involved that much, you can kind of consider them a, a quote unquote full-time coach, but really a full-time staff member to me is someone who is this, this is their primary thing, right? Versus their part-time is this is their secondary thing. So maybe, Hey, I'm a school teacher. I'm an attorney. I love coaching CrossFit and I'm here, you know, 10 hours a week, but this is not my bread and butter. This isn't my career. When someone like you said, Jason says, this is my career. This is what I do. There's your full-time coach. Yeah. So full disclosure, like I don't, you well, know, I don't have any full time coaches. I have a couple of coaches that probably make close to that, that could probably live off of that. Um, but that's not because the business is in a position to do that. That's because like I'm slowly transitioning those guys away from their day job. So we're in Virginia Beach, heavy military town. I was former military. Um, I've had coaches on my staff for. I have almost no turnover whatsoever with coaching staff. So we I have guys that have been on my staff for four years and they finally made that decision. They're like, Hey, I want to get out and this is what I want to pursue. So we start putting together that 24 month plan, mm -hmm. which then kind of puts me on the hook. And I'm like, okay, if we're going to do that, these things need to happen. Like the business needs to be at a certain amount of revenue. Like we need to have specialty programs in place. Like there needs to be ways for them to earn because, and, and you'll have to tell them that, like, you'll have to sit down and be like, Hey, you coming here full time does not mean that you just take a bigger piece of the current pie. Like you have to help grow the business in order to do that. And I'll help you, but you have to be down with helping me. And a lot, a lot of new or part-time coaches just don't fundamentally grasp that concept. Sure. Uh, all right, cool. Um, thank you for addressing that. Um, next question here, uh, Joel, uh, Question is, we're looking to grow our coaching staff, obviously keeping in mind what you've gone over today, what would you recommend for interning new coaches to your staff? Um, so I don't, I think uh, we're going to get into this pretty heavily in episode two, uh, but here's guys. the major take. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's the, here's the major takeaway for this, which is um, your intern 
process should primarily be structured around getting about around producing a good teammate, Mm -hmm. not necessarily a good coach. Like that should happen as well. Like if you don't have a good, a a decent coach at the end of that, um, you should probably revamp it, but primarily it should be a filter system. In short, I want to find out if this person is a turd or not. (laughs) Right. Are they going to play nice with the rest of the coaches? Are they going to be a team player? Are they, are they bought into our culture? And us leading this tribe together, right? And that's that's at the end of the day what it comes down to. Coaches development program, in my opinion, for in or interning someone new isn't so much about the the I'm gonna teach you how to fix a squat as much as it is I wanna see if you're gonna play nice. Yeah, I mean I look at it almost yeah, it has very little to do with me. You, like there, there's certain there's certain minimum requirements that they have to have and like they need to know certain Sure. Things. throw on them randomly occasionally just to make them sweat but i really just want to find out like do i like this person um so here's one for you and this is one that i use regularly use the airport test and the airport test looks like this do you want to be stuck in the airport with this person for 15 hours if the answer is no they probably should not make it through the intern process because you're going to be you're going to be spending an incredible amount of time with these people you should like them yeah. or at the very least you should see potential. So not everybody you're going to love, like that's not a real thing. Um, but you should be able to identify the potential and be like, Hey, this person has value and I see it. It's, it's the challenge to me is to pull that value out of them. Right. Um, so that's primarily what you're doing. You know, the, the intern process is really to, is to see like, do they show up on time? Do they do things without being prompted? Do they follow directions? Simple. That's it. Yeah. If they can't do those three things, like, hey, maybe this isn't for you. Right. Okay, last question here from Greg, and then we'll, we'll cut it off for today. Uh, Greg's question, uh, how many hours a week would you see as tops for a full-time coach? So I would say... If you're talking Monday through Friday, probably 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's coachable hours, right? That's not the in-between doing other other tasks yeah, yeah, and that's, things, right? That's so that's actually, classes. That's actually tough. classes. That's classes. Now, they could, there's a little wiggle room in that number if they're doing personal training and some other stuff on the side. But let's let's just stick with group classes for the sake of this question, unless Greg is wants the full, the full Monty on that. But I, I would say 15, and that number is based on this. Um, if you've coached a lot, you know that anything past three classes, your fourth one is shitty. Right. At least without a big break. Yeah. At least without a big break. Uh, And now the caveat to that is if you're doing it well, Mm -hmm. if you're walking into the class and you're hustling and you're excited and you're teaching and correcting and you're running around the room and you're interacting with people. That is a lot of emotional equity that you are giving away in a given hour. So that is exhausting. Yep. And I, and I don't know many people that can do four really good classes in a day. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I fancy myself a pretty good coach and four is a lot. Yep. I, I've done seven or eight. I've done hundred hour months. Uh, mm-hmm. And I can tell you like the 6 p.m. class is not getting what the noon class got or the 3 p.m. class got. And it's not because I don't care. It's because I'm a human being and I just can't give that much. Uh, And, you know, there's a degree of degradation based on the coach's experience. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, like you just don't want to burn them out. Like you want them to be there. Like you just don't want them to burn out. Like now they're going to fluctuate a little bit and they might take four or five occasionally. But for the most part, 15 to 20 is probably where you're going to top people out just because this is in their interest to continue to be excited about showing up. So it doesn't turn into a complete groundhog's day because this can do that, but also in the interest of the members, because the 6 PM is going to know based on the coach's body language, what they're saying, how much they're moving around the room, that they're exhausted right. and they're paying you a lot of money and they shouldn't get that. So, um, that's just on my experience and what I've seen with, with coaches. 
um, that like I usually don't like to push people past three a day. Yeah, yeah, we had we had the same rule. The, it was between three and four. And it was dependent on that person's capacity. You know, you have some people who are socially really, really strong. And for them to do a three, four hour or three, four class a day, right? We would then break it up. Four classes, no problem. Sometimes even we even had some who did really well with five. For me, five, I was actually able to do if I broke it up with about a two hour break in between. And that, but that was the whole day. But really, ideally, yeah, it's three or four. And if you want to knock it out of the park, because you always have to come back to, was that worthy of calling that the best hour of their day, right? The whole point for your members is not just to come in and make it through the class and for you to get them through the workout. Every class has to be looked at as a personal training session with 10 people, 15 people, and you are there to knock it out of the park. The entire class has to have a, 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 it's a complete experience for them that they should walk away going, that was an awesome class every single time. Not just, hey, I'm tired. Sorry, guys. It's been a long day. There is no excuse. You should never be justifying why this is going to be a, a shittier class to any yeah. member. So if you find yourself feeling like that or, or a, a coach complaining about that, you, you have to acknowledge that for what it is. And I know that sometimes staffing can be a challenge or you get caught, you know, off guard and you're shorthanded and you're covering more classes than you should. But at the end of the day, if it's not as, if every class isn't as good as the last, you're, you're already selling yourself short. You're, you're doing a a disservice to your clients. I I would agree hundred percent on the flip side of that. I think uh, there's a lot of gym. I don't know that there's a ton of gyms that are um, exceeding class numbers. Mm-hmm. Meaning like they have coaches that are coaching a ton. I do see far more gyms that have coaches that, um, so I have a rule, like if they cannot give me 10 classes a month, they don't come on or, or I will take them off. Um, and there's a ton of gyms who have people that coach one or two classes a month, mm-hmm. um, or six or seven. And for me, I just don't find that to be any value added for a lot of reasons. Those five or six classes could be given to somebody who has more time and cares more. Uh, they could be given back to me to reduce some overhead. Uh, but past that, from a development standpoint, because that's what we're talking about, that is not enough frequency to get feedback and implement it in order to improve. Like, yeah. it's just not enough time. So there's a ton of – like, if you have coaches that are coaching less than 10 hours a month, uh, I strongly – would recommend that you consider reducing your coaching staff. Right. Awesome. Well, uh, Jason, uh, I, I think this has been a, a fantastic episode. This is probably one of the longest ones we've done as I think we could go on oh. and on about this. And, uh, I'm actually super pumped to get into next week's, which is going to show, yeah. we're going to walk you guys through how to actually intern on board and integrate a new coach into your ecosystem which is probably for us as, as a business coaches in, uh, on the gym right side, we get this question constantly. Like, how do I do this? How do I hire someone? Where do I find people? And so on. Um, and, uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll dig into that stuff next week. Um, so, uh, Jason, um, I mean, where can people find more about you and, uh, you know, if they want to follow you or uh, jerk block talk, um, mm-hmm. where can they find you? Um, on Facebook, just Jason Fernandez. If you guys want to instant message me, just hit me up on Facebook, on Instagram, jfern3. Uh, I've been a little not active on there lately, but this, we've got a ton of stuff going on at the gym. Um, CrossFitRife.com, CrossFitRife on Facebook. Um, Jerk Block Talk is the YouTube channel. So, uh, I would actually love feedback from anybody on this thread. I'll actually post, um, a link to comments down below. Sure. Uh, I would love your feedback. Good, bad, or indifferent. If you're like, hey, this sucks, or if there's something that you want me to cover, uh, a lot of those episodes are not things that I came up with. They're people that are like, hey, um, what would you do in this scenario? And then I break it down in the gym. So um, th- I just like doing that. I think it's fun. Uh, it's, it's what I'm good at. So if you have stuff that you, questions that you want to cover, um, and it doesn't have to be like just coaching a lot of, if you guys look at the YouTube channel, I mean, it's everything. It's like how to write your gym manual. It's like how to deal with like, I mean, we've gone like Nat Sass and some of this stuff where it's like, if you're coaching a class and somebody walks in and you're the only person there, how do you deal with that scenario? Like that kind of stuff. Right so on. 
Yeah. Um, it's a gold mine, yeah. guys. Go check it out. No question. Jerk block talk on YouTube. Um, cool. All right. Well, then um, let's go ahead and call it for today. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Jason, again, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for being on. Um, yep. We'll have part two, same time, same place next week. Um, and uh, have yourself a great weekend. I'll, I'll chat with you again here in a little bit. Uh, but uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this week. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here in the network. And, uh, and if, again, if you're watching this after the fact, uh, don't hesitate to put your comments in below. Any questions you've got, feedback you've got, we'd love to help you out. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys again next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.